today in thinking of challenging punishment, we move from the macro level examinations of surveillance and control during the war on drugs and the impact on mass incarceration to now really hone into the lives of impacted individuals. And the charge for today's panel, panel two, is to deal with the promises and perils of doing ethnography in the midst of the war on drugs. We want to think about the ethics of the work that they do, seeing as how their populations are triply vulnerable sometimes if we can think about race, gender, class, sexuality, all measures are axes of stratification. And so what might be the ethics of doing research on this population when you expose their lives to people who have no insight to what's going on? What are the great things about that? And what might be some of the harms for doing so? So very roughly, we'll go in the follow following order with Rick Curtis, Nancy Campbell, Camila Helpi Acosta, and Keisha Middlemass giving comments on their work in this field. Rick is going to illuminate a bit about hmm, the multiple projects he's done, looking at ethnography, bringing the behaviors, the lives, the health of the marginal to the fore. He studied injecting drug users and HIV risk, heroin use, homicide and violence, and commercial sexual exploitation amongst groups in New York City, New York State, and New Jersey. Nancy Campbell is a historian of science and medicine and professor of science and technology at RPI. She looks at gender, drug policy, and the history of drug treatment and social justice. Camila Helpi Acosta is a postdoc at the National Development and Research Institute and adjunct assistant professor of anthropology at John Jay. Her ethnography of drug using populations and their health outcomes will be the focus of her talk today. And last but not least, we'll have Keisha Middlemass, who is in the Department of Political Science at Trinity University, and she will examine the intersection of race and institutions of public policy, and specifically think about the gendered implications of the work that she does. So to start, we will have Rick Curtis, who is currently the Chair of Anthropology at, at John Jay, kick this off for us. I'm looking forward to a great panel to wonderful comments from all of you. So let's get this started. Thank you very much. I, let me just correct the introduction. I'm the former chair now. I quit uh, the, first day of, the first day of school, which was August 28th. Um, one of the reasons I quit has to do with um, with the fact that, uh, that I was arrested last year. That had nothing to do with the institution, but uh, my decision. And let me just say that when I was a student at Columbia many years ago, my first arrest was at uh, 21 years old. And um, my advisor had told me going into the field that when you get arrested, don't call me. And so when I did get arrested, I didn't call him. And um, you know, I was not in jail very long. And when they let me out, I decided that to be an anthropologist was a cool thing, but maybe not in another country where I couldn't get a lawyer so easily. So I came back here and started doing anthropology in the United States, working for the Vera Institute, and I got arrested the next year again. And um, to my surprise, the Vera Institute didn't give me a lawyer either. And uh, in fact, they fired me twice, and, um, but hired me back again, surprisingly. Um, and I went back to work for the Vera Institute in 1988 to do a study of the tactical narcotics team and their impact on crack markets at that time. And um, surprisingly, I found out that uh, they, had not, they had never expunged my records as they told me they were going to do if I was a good boy for a short period of time. And so the Vera Institute went to the Albany 
and went through great expense and effort to expunge my records, though I'm not really confident that that happened. Um, last year I was arrested twice, once at the uh, House of Representatives office building in Hal Rogers' office, chained together with a lot of other people protesting the Republicans' intransigence on allowing federal funding for needle exchange programs. And the second time, arrested by the police in the 75th Precinct in Brooklyn um, for, for weed. Um, now, I live in the 73rd Precinct. They actually arrested me in my pre precinct, but dragged me over to 75. Um, let's just say that John Jay neither provided me with a lawyer or any kind of indication that they were mm, had any feeling about it one way or the other. But, um, you know, several other things that happened over the last year lack of institutional support, let's say, sort of tipped me in the direction of not wanting to be the chair of that department anymore because I've not had a real good experience with institutions vis-a-vis -vis my own work and their support thereof. Um, I do want to talk to you a bit, not about myself today, but about the work that we've recently done in, in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, and my presentation is Zombies of the South Bronx. Now, I, I do want to preface this a, a bit no, more about myself to say that I've lived in Brownsville for the last 25 years, and uh, when I go to vote at the school next door to me, they say, oh, the white guy is here, if that gives you any indication of what that neighborhood is like. And recently, we've seen a lot of changes in the neighborhood. I, I've actually been stopped and frisked several times there. Not surprisingly, it's sort of weird to see a white guy of my age walking around a neighborhood, so they do stop me and frisk me at odd hours. Um, but the things that we saw in the South Bronx in August when we did this research at St. Anne's, and I'd like to give a shout out to Bart and Joyce um, for you know, helping us with this study and allowing me to present it today. The things that we're seeing in the South Bronx are precisely what we're seeing in my neighborhood, which is not experiencing gentrification, um, even though they'd like you to believe that even though they'd like you to believe that the South Bronx is also gentrifying, it really isn't. Um, it's being used for some other purpose. And, you know, it's a great thing that the prisons in New York are emptying out. But in my view, they're emptying out into my neighborhood. And while I support that, by all means, it's what's happening to them when they come out that's most disturbing to me because I see it every day walking out of my door. And they're being released, not to their own recognizance or to their families, but to institutions that exist in my neighborhood, run by private companies for the most part. Um, and they're making money off these people. Why keep them locked up if you can't make money off of them? Send them back to their neighborhoods where they can't live in public housing, mind you, because they have felony convictions, and so they must move into narco freedom or reality house or any number of places, I don't mean to pick on the drug treatment programs, there's so many variety from which to pick. Um, and they're using them as cogs in their wheel to make money for private enterprise. Um, why I say zombies of the South Bronx, I don't think that most of you probably, given the, the rash of zombie movies we have these days, really understand the origins of the term zombie or where it came from. But um, you know, a zombie originally, before the TV version of it came along, was a person who was socially dead. A person who was alive but socially dead. And it originated in Haiti, this idea that you could kill somebody um, with a drug, mind you, that would make them appear dead. And they did that with people that were pains in the butt. Somebody that was undesirable in the community, you could go and get a drug administered to that person that would make them appear dead and their relatives and the people that didn't like them would rush down to the Hall of Records and immediately get a death certificate for that person to make them dead. And when the person woke up from their stupor and tried to reclaim their lives, everybody looked at them and said, but you're dead and we have a, birth, a death certificate to show that. And so your house is no longer your house, your car is no longer your car, your wife is no longer your wife. I would suggest to you that this is precisely what we've done with prisoners in this country they're socially dead people. They cannot return, they do not return, for the majority of them, to become living again. We've X them off the map. 
Instead, they've returned to be zombies, to work as slaves for the person that killed them, in this case, the surrogates of the person that killed them, if you will, the private enterprises that are swarming over my neighborhood, buying up buildings left and right, putting in three-quarter houses that are unsupervised, sex offender residences, you name it, they got it, you know? And these are the people that they're, you know, making money off of. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. I guess you can't see it up there, right? It's invisible, thank you very much. Good to know. Um, you know, but the one, the only good thing that I could ever say about prisons is that you had an end date to it. Unlike these programs, which have no end date to it, there is no expiration date. In fact, your exit from the system is almost impossible because they want to make money off of you and they're going to find a way to ensure that you remain in that system for life. In fact, the earlier presentations that we heard about children coming through the school system, they're grooming them for that system. You know, right now they gotta take newbies. Um, you know, I could only imagine had I grown up in that neighborhood, actually my kids did grow up in that neighborhood, but thank God I had girls, you know? Um, but in any event, this is what we're seeing. We did a study, I want to tell you not so much about me and my neighborhood, but the study that we did recently in the Bronx, and we recruited um, 300, actually 309, but we were trying to get 300 uh, drug injectors because we think that there's a need for a safe injection facility in the Bronx and other places. So we went up to find out what are their needs. We recruited 300 people, it took us 10 days to do so. Um, they range between 18 and 70 years old. The average age was 42 of the injectors. 74% were male in our sample, though I think the true ratio of male to female is probably closer to 50-50. 66% Latino, 16% um, other. 41% um, 40, of our sample, this echoes a comment I heard earlier, 41% of our sample had been to jail in the last year. Um, what percentage has health care coverage? Well, you'd be, for all of you who think that people don't have health care coverage, 90% of our people had health care coverage. And that's because if they don't have coverage, you can't make money off them. So they're damn well sure going to make sure they have coverage. The rest of the people that live in the, the neighborhood who are not criminally justice, criminally just, criminal justice involved, you can bet probably don't have the same you know, level of health care coverage. Um, the disturbing thing, I mean, there are many disturbing things, but the, one of the things that disturbs me most of all, given my history of involvement with harm reduction programs, is that 80% of our samples said that they injected in public. Why is that? They can't go home to inject at Narco Freedom or on any of the other facilities that they have, they'd get booted out. And there are no more shooting galleries, there are no, no places to go, so they're injecting in the street and discarding their syringes in the street. How many would use a safe injection facility if we asked them? 75% said definitely, another 20% said probably. So, um, in conclusion, I'm not going to take your time too long because I like the comments and I want to hear what the other people have to say. But um, you can bet that the swift replacement of these monetized clients is going to ensure the stability and the expansion of this system which we've erected over the last, well, it's been many years, but it's really ramping up now. Um, pervasive, and, pervasive supervision and management of the populations that we're dealing with here le leads to increased risk behaviors. The more you watch them, the riskier their behavior is going to become because they have to do it secretively, which leads to stupid decisions. And finally, preventing the spread of HIV and HCV and the other kind of nasty viruses and things that are out there is going to require things like a safe injection facility. So I would urge you to help us make that happen. Um, there are people at Citywide and, and uh, Washington Heights Corner Project and many other people at the other exchanges that are um, with us behind that, but we need all the help we can get. So thank you very much. As you all know, I'm not an ethnographer, I'm a historian, and um, 
I, I'm very interested, however, in the history of ethnographic encounters um, in the United States. And so I'm going to contextualize uh, my remarks today in, in two ways. One is I, I want to say that in, in many ways I think that we paid a lot of attention ethnographically to drug use by people of color, and we've had a kind of attention deficit disorder when it comes to ethnographic work on uh, drug use by white people. And uh, secondly, I want to say that I've come to understand ethnographers as often entering the field only to find themselves kind of stranded within the very structures and contexts of which they are most critical and which compel them to enter uh, the field. And one of those large structures has been a kind of uh, historical amnesia around the convergence in this country between criminalization and medicalization. We tend to kind of split them out, but in fact there's been a real convergence that I think we have to pay a lot of attention to. This, you can't see it. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, it's an aerial photograph of um, the narcotic farm, and it is what the public health approach looked like even before the age of mass incarceration. The narcotic farm was the concrete embodiment of a U.S. public health service approach that was perhaps less coercive and more humane than today's prison industrial complex. But if you, if you could look at it, um, you would see a prison. You would see a prison a 1,500 bed prison. Now who went to Lexington? Those unfortunate enough to get caught. And in the early days of this institution, which opened in the mid-1930s, that was largely people about Rick's demographic. So older um, white males, poor white males tended to um, go there. And then later in the 1950s, many, many people from this city, uh, a much younger crowd, a more Latino crowd, a black or browner crowd, uh, began to uh, go to this, but it was certainly built as an alternative to prison in the days when prisons first became overcrowded uh, with drug users. Um, for me, also as a historian, I should tell you that um, uh, the war on drugs doesn't start, didn't start in the 1970s. So to challenge punishment, I think it's very important that we define the values, practices, and rights for a public health and safety approach without built-in safeguards. In other words, these kind of well-intentioned new approaches, and again, you can't see this, but this is um, showing how very much, you know, this is public enlightenment, which you can get at the federal narcotic farm if you are a victim of drug addiction um, in the 1930s. Without built-in safeguards, in other words, these kinds of approaches, and particularly now that we have privatization on the horizon, revert to something much more punishing. Ethnography, however, is one site where some strategic redefinition has historically occurred and can occur. Because we turn to ethnography, as Michael Agar says, when paradigms crash. When we need to actually know what's happening to people, how drug policy is actually affecting how people live their lives, and who is affected how. Now, several decades ago, when I started work on the project that became Using Women, I prematurely and judgmentally and with great apology now, concluded that ethnography's perils definitely outweighed um, its promises because I feared that it would enable an ethnographic state to intrude further and further into drug-using women's lives and exacerbate their vulnerability to precisely the kinds of things that we were talking about earlier in terms of uh, child welfare interventions. Yet without ethnography, I think we cannot effectively challenge punishment. In other words, it's crucial to know how users experience the world and think about health, the risks they run, the harms that they do and don't attend to, the significance of their practices, and how these change over time. In other words, I want all the ethnographers in the room to know, many of my best friends are ethnographers um, in this arena, um, and I love what you do, but be aware that you are producing an archives. You're producing historical documentation. Ethnographers produce realist accounts that can engender empathy and reduce social distance, but they can also, particularly in the context that we're in, do precisely the opposite. State sponsors' ethnographies tend to depict users as socially dislocated and out of control, framing drug users as dangerous practitioners of risky business who are fundamentally different from those who use socially prescribed drugs and you know, it, they're in need, uh, you can't see any of this, can you? 
They're lovely, beautiful pictures. If you haven't seen them, you can see some of them in the Narcotic Farm book. Um, all right, so ethnographers work, um, and, and here I'm very interested in, um, the, there's a recent crop of treatment ethnographies, and if you haven't seen the, if you can't see these, I'll read the titles. Breaking Women, um, Jill McCorkle's book, Scripting Addiction by Summerson Carr, The Clinic and Elsewhere uh, by Todd Myers, and The Pastoral Clinic by An Angela Garcia. Um, this, this is a crop of treatment ethnographies, uh, a very fine and interesting uh, form of ethnography, but these have done nothing to set my fears to rest. Many drug treatment programs then and now are downright coercive, meant to break them down to build them up, which is what Jill McCorkle's work um, is specifically about. And if that isn't punishment, I don't know what is. So I think we really do need to get clear about what we're asking in calling for more treatment, more medicalization, a public health and safety approach. As long as users are constructed as threatening to public health and safety, as dangerous to themselves and others, they are not understood as publics in and of themselves. And that, I think, is the, the problem um, embedded in ethnography. At the same time, I think there are things that ethnography can do to challenge punishment. And here, because I'm a historian, I'm just going to very quickly um, flip through a little bit. This is Bingham Dye um, and um, Alfred Linda Smith, and they're using Chicago as a social laboratory to criticize older sociological theories, uh, the older sort of Durkheimian concept of anime which is based on the idea that society has to regulate insatiable appetites or risk unleashing a state of normlessness. And although Durkheim didn't point this out, that has been a racialized idea in Western cultures. Indeed, Durkheim saw the driving force of human insatiability as akin to the structure of addiction. You can, you can maybe read that? Okay, great. Um, documenting, in other words, what these early ethnographers did us the favor of doing was documenting the presence of social norms among opiate addicts in Chicago, and that was essential to the project of humanizing addicts, a project that would be continued, of course, by Howard Becker in, the in his 1951 Chicago dissertation on becoming a marijuana user. Now, Becker, um, view drug use as a career, albeit a deviant one, an insight that remains fruitful for reducing social distance. Um, understanding that prevailing definitions of addiction were arbitrary and not based on real knowledge of the process of addiction or the social world of addicts, these early ethnographers did try to understand the meanings at work in the process of commitment um, to the identity junkie. Some individuals, they argued, became uh, committed to conventional norms and other people uh, became committed to uh, routines that were deemed illegitimate by the larger society that eventually became their master or controlling um, identity. So as quintessential deviants, um, these, the, the addicts with whom these sociologists kind of worked out um, their theories um, led them to understand that addiction uh, was not an ontological state, but a habitual form of social activity that could be otherwise. In other words, learning to become a drug user was a social process that was accompanied by routines that became a way of knowing and a way of identifying um, who you are, that became ordinary and not extraordinary, uh, which Becker uh, still you know, still writes about um, precisely this kind of thing. In other words, these drug ethnographies, old and new, have attempted to denaturalize um, a lot of the assumptions that hold in place uh, the kind of uh, popular uh, common sense around uh, drugs and drug policy. Many of you would probably know anthropologist Ed Preble and John Casey's classic, Taking Care of Business, um, which redefined perceptions of how much work it takes to maintain an active heroin habit and documented exactly how structural and economic constraints affect subcultural bonds, the very relatedness um, between individuals. And Ripping and Running, Michael Agar's um, linguistic anthropology, which was written at the Narcotic Farm, um, criticized prevailing views that drug behaviors were maladaptive. And this is where we begin to see drug ethnographers take, begin to take treatment on. Because what this ethnography is partly about is uh, beginning to uh, criticize um, the label, uh, the labeling by psychiatrists at the narcotic farm um, of um, 
things like paranoia or alienation as realistic adaptations to the carceral context. So ethnographers have been very useful in terms of adapt how did uh, people adapt to the extension of the carceral system uh, further and further and further into uh, people's lives. Okay. Um, so, let's see. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, women on heroin. This is not a woman on heroin. This is a patient withdrawing in detox at Lexington. Uh, but Marsha Rosenbaum's Women on Heroin was an early ethnography in 1981 um, that really brought into high relief the deleterious aspects of the treatment scene. Uh, she saw women on heroin as women first, as oppressed. Uh, by the same structures of gender subordination as other women and saw treatment as a form of social control that was exerted over habits and lives. And I think that that you know, is very important, but at the same time, it tells us something about the coextension um, of the carceral system into the treatment system and the ways in which people access uh, treatment at that time. So in other words, there are many things uh, that ethnography can do. And, and promises um, that it can, in fact, um, bring to us. But we also have later versions, right? Late 1980s, early 1990s state ethnographies um, that are extended to non-institutionalized populations um, in ways that are designed to bring to public notice so-called hidden populations. Think about that language, right? Who's a hidden population? What's a hidden population? Why is the state funding ethnographies on hidden populations. I mean, the population that is most hidden by that move, in fact, given who, what the, these ethnographies were, um, in fact, about, that um, were, 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 was white drug use. Um, and so state ethnography um, is one of those things that I, um, it was an ambivalence about that uh, that drove me to begin to try to write um, historically about ethnography and about the kinds of things um, that ethnographers do. This is not to say um, that ethnographic work is not quite self-reflexive, right? Ethnographers, often anthropologists, quite self-reflexive. Um, went through a, the field, you know, goes through a whole uh, thing in the 1980s that's about examining its own practices. And so they are quite clear, this is Mitch Ratner, in a book, um, a, a, an edited multi-sided ethnography, Crack Pipe as Pimp, warning his readers not to think that the phenomenon that that book is about and the title, um, the incredibly racialized and sexualized uh, title is the only thing that this book is about. The problem is nobody can get the title out of their head. And so the, the, and, and the very uh, the descriptions of degradation um, that are essentially to that ethnography, um, no disclaimer. Um, can, can really kind of quell um, concerns. And so it, it does seem to me that, and I'm, I'm very close to time, aren't I? Yeah, two minutes, okay. Um, so, so this is Michael Agar again, um, returning to um, the idea of what happens when paradigms crash. In other words, if ethnographers um, have ideas about ways to do ethnography differently, right? The racial politics of ethnography, I think, really do, like the racial politics of history, uh, really do depend on maintaining a kind of doubled vision, um, a focus on past and present, on what is the relevance of these kinds of ethnographies, what's the nature of them as historical materials, um, and on criminalization and medicalization. And what do these ethnographies tell us about the convergence between medicalization and criminalization and social control? And what kind of relevance do they have um, uh, for our discussions about this kind, the ethics of ethnographic um, exposure. Thank you. We will definitely have an issue uh, with my presentation as I rely on your ability to view the slides. And my background is black, so you won't be able to see anything. I will be, however, trying to be as interactive as possible and to remediate this issue. Um, okay, so I'm here uh, as an ethnographer uh, to present uh, some of the data that I've been able to gather for, from an amazing human beings here in New York City. Street drug users, homeless drug users, heroin users, junkies. Self-described, self-portrayed junkies. This is not my term, it's their term. And the whole point of my presentation that hopefully will remain within 15 minutes 
uh, is to present to you guys the other ways in which the war on drugs is implicated in the subjectivity of a street heroin user, of the, the type of heroin user that is right within the, the war on drugs bullseye. It is targeted specifically by the punishment of approach in the war on drugs. Of course, in order, for, in order for us to understand that, we need to be able to compare what the experience, those experiences that I'm about to bring, to the experience of those who are outside of the bullseye, who are not targeted by the war on drugs, and who behave in the exact same ways, use the same drugs, with the same frequency, in the same frequency, and oftentimes even have a physiological dependence to it, what we call socially integrated heroin users. And it's only by comparing that we can actually detect not just how the war on drugs puts people in jail and shatters upper mobility, but how it actually cuts across every single minute aspect of each of those individuals' humanity. And my, intent, my, my attempt here is to show you that. So here we go. Before, as I just said, uh, I'm gonna give you some background first. How did we get here? How did we shape the junkie? Uh, I'm gonna show you some snap, uh, snapshot, snapshot, snap, snapshot picture of what the contemporary junkie looks like sociodemographically in New York City, of course. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you my primary data. After that, I'm gonna give you five uh, arguments and how I try to, to answer the research question, does the war on drugs affect the subjectivity of a street heroin user in any other way besides just placing the label criminal? So here we go. We know from historians, uh, US historians, drug historians, that uh, the label junkie was the etymology of that word uh, was extracted from in writing in, in, in the 1920s, right after the 1914 Hardison Narcotics Act, right after the first attempt to illegalize heroin, emerged the junkie in New York City, in fact. And the word is extracted from this visual of having guys, boys, males, uh, going through junkyards, literally, in the city, trying to scavenge our items of value to, to, to sell and score some heroin. Ergo, the term junkie. Um, then later on in 1956, the Harrison Narcotic, uh, uh, the, not, the Narcotics Control Act made things uh, a little bit more difficult by flat out, completely, comprehensively illegalizing prescription, recreational, any type of uh, heroin use in the city. Courtright, Musto, and others associate that law directly with the creation of a new junkie, the new era of the junkie, the black male from the inner city, which is still, of course, the kind of junkie that we're seeing today. Um, again, I only use the term junkie because it really is how they self-portray, not because I am for the negative underpinnings that such a term has. Um, 100 years after the Harrison Narcotics Act, What's ha what has happened today? We have 80% of injection drug users in New York City uh, tend to be male. 50% Latino, 37% white, and black African Americans are rapidly declining, and we all know how the AIDS epidemic has dev devastated that particular community. Uh, they're aging, most of them are over 40. 60% are below poverty level, 65% are below poverty levels. 62% are homeless, or have experienced homeless in the past 12 months. And 33% in the past 12 months have been incarcerated on drug possession charges. HIV prevalence, 70, about 17%. Hep C prevalence, a disturbing 72%. <clears throat> Who is the socially integrated heroin user? Well, luckily, we do have researchers who have been canvassing that area. Contemporary research. And they have found that heroin use does not unavoidably lead to physical or mental dependence, the so-called addiction. People can actually use heroin recreationally and in control. <clears throat> they have also found that physical dependence is not synonymous of social disintegration, meaning you don't become a sex worker for having a, 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 a phys physiological dependence on heroin. One thing does not follow the other. That causality is actually very mistaken. And number three, of course, what we all know, most escape the war on drugs for being located outside of its bullseye, the inner city. 
So, again, my research question, aside from casting them as criminals, how else is the war on drugs implicated in their subjectivities and in their experiences of who they are? Um, I collected, uh, in 2010, I uh, conducted 28 in-depth interviews to ask questions like this uh, with street heroin users, uh, active heroin users, older than 18, uh, poor New York City res residents, and they needed to speak English or Spanish. I am Puerto Rican, I speak Spanish. Uh, I used novel sampling, and I used the seeds, particularly in t try to be intelligent about seed recruitment in order to ensure that race, there was variance in race, ethnicity, and also gender. I paid from my own pocket uh, for this um, study, but I'm happy about it. Uh, what did I find? 86% were males, not surprising. 46% uh, were street homeless at the time of the interview. All of them were poor. Um, they were mostly Hispanics and, and, and whites, and by Hispanic I mainly uh, mean Puerto Ricans. 86% um, had very low educational attainment if they had a GAD, a GED. 90% injected drugs, and 100% had been arrested in the past, had been, had, had been arrested uh, on drug possession charges. So I think you can see some of this. Um, the junkie world, that's what it says in the, at the top that you can't read. Setting the stage, this is what I have found. The first thing that strikes an ethnographer when she ventures into the street and talk to the people who are targeted by the war on drugs and the punishment approach is the junkie world. I've seen not just what it, heroin, has done to me. Part of the life on heroin is seeing other heroin addicts. That's part of the junkie's life. Cops going to jail, getting abscesses, dying, overdosing, seeing other junkies. This is normal, everyday life for them. And it kind of, in their lived experience, how they embody this social experience is, like I said there, unlike the experience of the non-junkie, the socially integrated heroin user, for the straight heroin user, social disintegration and physical decay are intrinsic parts of being a heroin user. As I shall, as I shall portray in what follows, becoming this kind of heroin user, a junkie, they experience as unavoidable. Heroin fate. <clears throat> I hope to stop using one day. I hope to be like them, non-heroin users one day. I hope one day to be able to imitate them and to be who I'm supposed to be. But I have tried and have been unable to. Once on heroin, nobody can really quit heroin. This is so common among street heroin users. It's cultural, I should say. It's part of a common understanding. Am I saying that everybody feels this way? Of course not. Generalizations are never safe. But I am saying it is very prevalent. Uh, While well, Francisco, the, the, the person who, who shared this with me, uh, still wants to be a productive member of society, like all of us here, productive people who are helping and paying taxes. Uh, his many failed attempts to quit heroin simply confirm that once, once on heroin, he's just always going to be on heroin. There's no way out. Again, the heroin fate. I have met so many guys who begin as chippers. They don't use every day, only every other weekend and stuff. But they end up hooked. They, at the end, they, all, they always end up hooked. In the end, we end up here, pointing at the neighborhood. That's what heroin does to you. Lived experience. While the war on drugs create the junkie world within which they operate and exclusively targets heroin using, users within that word, world, they, they generalize their heroin experiences as a heroin fate that would occur to anyone who uses heroin. Of course, we know this is not true. We know that the vast majority of people who use any drug never lose control and don't do sex work to support their habits. Nonetheless, that's not the experience of the poor street heroin user. And I think that's why we need it to understand that we need to see how, it, how the experience takes place across social classes so that we can get a little perspective on what is it that we're calling addiction and what is it that we're calling crime. Experiences and objective conditions that Ponder, Zeppelin, Louise, and all of my folks experience, they see other junkies, only confirm the, the heroin fate. I have five minutes, so I gotta run through this. Emotions, how, do the, how does the war on drugs affect emotions? Stigma and guilt, dog, white male, Lower East Side, Tompkins Tumpkin, Tumpkin Square Park, astigmata, how people look at you. Most people look at it, heroin, as an evil thing. Look at what it does to you. Maybe it's the guilt that I'm not working. That's just the guilt that I carry. I have a conscience, you know? 
heroin, heroin use comes with the price, the guilt that I deal with. He literally said the word guilt and then the word stigma about 17 times, each of them, throughout our two hour long interview. <clears throat> Lived experience, again, the illegality of the substance not only forces the label criminal upon the heroin user, it also makes Doc, doc feel, feel ashamed, ashamed of his continued heroin use. His inability to find illicit, illicit work, I should say, illicit work, is a major source of stigma and guilt. He feels unproductive. He's not helping society. I only have about four minutes, so I'm going to run through some of these slides uh, quite quickly. Um, Heroin love, no pain. Heroin is the best thing I've ever tried. It's a dimension where nobody can fuck with me. I am in love with heroin. I love heroin. It's the best hug you could imagine. Penelope, white, Brooklyn girl. Zach, Puerto Rican, homeless guy, Bronx. <clears throat> Lived experience, they're both homeless and have a history of sexual abuse, of course. They're not receiving any therapeutic help for those uh, traumas. Penelope has HIV AIDS and was recently evicted from her Hassan apartment because she came up with a positive urine test. Heroin is their only source of emotional relief. Homelessness in both cases results from illicit drug use. Again, how punishment creates also human emotion, right? And love for heroin, perhaps. As such, these emotions are intimately tied to the war on drugs. I'm gonna skip through some of these slides um, so that I can at least show you how the individual blames himself or herself. Um, and then with that, I'll wrap up. Um, the heroin mind, that's the title of this, uh, of this slide. I go to a detox and they will clean me up. But what about the mind? I lift the detox, walk around here and pop, all of a sudden, I want to do dope again. But why? Because of the mind. Nothing really changed. I gained a few pounds, lost my tan, but what about this in here? Stay the same, man. Luis, Puerto Rican, homeless, Bronx. Heroin lives with its experience and a permanent imprint in the individual's mind. It makes it very, very much harder for them to stop using heroin when they feel that heroin is governing their minds. It also makes them blame themselves for their deteriorated circumstances. For Luis, and for so many others that I can't show you for lack of time, it is their fault. It is not the war on drugs. It is not trauma. It is not anything other than their weak, terrible, wrong ways, bad choices. And how is the war on drugs related to that experience? Well, precisely because the war on drugs and the punishment approach is based on moral dichotomies around right and wrong, good and bad, clean and dirty. And all of my participants, over and over again, place themselves in the wrong side, in the dirty side, in the bad part of that dichotomy. It's their fault. It targets the punishment approach, the inner city poor, and creates a junkie world. I'm done with this, so we're good. And targets the inner, inner city poor and creates, therefore, a junkie world populated exclusively by people who end up feeling this way. In doing such, it creates a heroin subculture, as very much as Nancy was uh, speaking earlier, that influences these types of deep heroin emotions and damaged identities. It creates criminal records, as we all know, that shatters chances of upward, upward, upward mobility, upward mobility, but it's not just that you don't have upward mobility, it's that it confirms the heroin fate that you're already feeling in your experience in your everyday life. And effectively, of course, blames the victim. They all feel it is their fault. That's my presentation, and uh, that's a, uh, a picture, a drawing that I bought from, from, from one of my, my fellow uh, participants, informants, and it's a heart nailed by a heroin uh, nail. And the other nail reads, love hurts. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I purposely use pink because I'm doing gender in the field. 
Um, so the pink doesn't show up, so my apologies, I'll read to you. By training, I'm a political scientist, so I came to ethnographic research by mistake. I actually wanted to know how public policies impacted individuals at the local level, at the individual level, versus the top-down statistical models that a lot of my colleagues use. Uh, so I had to go into the field. I had to actually go talk to people and how they're impacted by the war on drugs, how they're impacted by the actual institutionalization of after effect of the war on drugs. So the war on drugs has taken multiple public policies that now criminalize a lot of people, marking them with the felony conviction, which now is almost forever. Uh, it is very hard to remove a felony conviction from one's record. It's not impossible, but it is really, really difficult. And so I went into the field to figure out how does now the felony conviction, particularly for those that are that have drug convictions, um, how do they re-enter if they are allowed to re-enter at all? So to understand the petite penal institution of a felony conviction, went into the field, I talked to people, I engaged with people, and today I'm going to share then some of my research that took place uh, in Newark, New Jersey. So doing gender in the field, what does that mean? It's as a woman going into the field, in a male-dominated service provider organization, I thought about gender, I thought about the cultural context. What does it mean with a woman showing up with a PhD asking individuals that may mostly do not have high school diplomas, what does that look like? Um, what are the ramifications of it? Needed to know cultural context, um, the gender dynamics of asking men about their relationships and not accepting their invitations to go out for coffee. Uh, what does informed consent mean, and what does that mean when they say no, but they continue to talk to you? And so then I'll also share some lessons learned. So the research location where I was in situ for 29 months, from February 2011 uh, to January or June, excuse me, 2013, Newark, New Jersey, reentry nonprofit organization provided a whole bunch of services. It's almost like a case manager that connected individuals to service providers, but also to government agencies. Newark has some public policies that do not restrict drug felons from getting services like TRA or temporary housing or emergency cash assistance, but it's always really time restricted. And so looking at that, and so I talked to case managers that then helped me locate the individuals that were in this study. Um, wanted to understand the social, political, institutional meaning of a felony conviction, what does it mean? Um, and also to reduce this researcher re researched dyad, I purposely used the word participant. A lot of political scientists, unfortunately, talk about subjects or informants. When you're in the criminal justice system, you should not be calling the people you're working with as informants. You shouldn't even be thinking about them as informants. You should be thinking about them as participating in their help, trying to then provide better services, or at least to go talk to the policymakers about the impact of the stupid policies um, that they have passed, or at least my personal idea of stupidity. So how to do this well? Um, I use triangulation. It is a classic research method where you're taking different types of data and then working to figure out how do they speak to each other, how then new themes and new models, new challenges emerge from the data. So participant observations over 29 months were combined then with 48 in-depth interviews. And then I also used archival research. Part of the war on drugs has also created these public and private databases that if you have a few pieces of information, you can find people, find out if they've got a conviction, find out what the conviction is for, where they serve time, um, and then figure out, try to piece together their lived experience. So I try to use all three types of data research to authenticate, but also to then uh, breed credibility into the stories that I was being told to make sure that the participant's story was grounded in as truthful experience in Newark versus just their perspective. Because sometimes if you talk to additional people, you find out that it's the same experience, that they're not nor they're, um, the odd experience, I'm an outsider. That's all odd experience to me. But finding and talking to lots and lots of people, you find out that it's actually normal. 
So the participants um, that I'm going to actually talk about come from the in-depth interview. 43 men, 5 women. There were not a lot of women at this nonprofit organization because Newark actually has some great nonprofit organizations that deal directly with women and their challenges of coming home with a drug conviction. Um, majority of them were black, 77%. There was 150 uh, hours of field work that complement this and then, as I mentioned, the archival research. So as an outsider, I have... I've been arrested. I don't, but I've never been charged. I don't have a felony conviction. I've never spent time in jail. I don't know what it means. So I am totally a stranger. I do not have much cultural context. I'm from Canada, um, so I'm a foreigner. I'm an alien uh, in legal terms, not part of the system. And yet I interacted and networked and found ways to access the system, but I had to know the cultural context that I would not be trusted. Um, I had to prove that I was not out to get anybody, um, that I wasn't going to report anybody to the parole officer. If they were doing an interview and they talked about crimes they committed but had not been charged or arrested, that I was not going to, you know, basically send them up the river or down the river, depending on where part of the state you're in. As a woman, I always had limited access. So some men talk in a way of, with other men that they don't talk when a woman's in the room. Um, and I, know, I don't know what goes on in the men's bathroom. I'm not particularly f interested in finding out, but I knew things would be discussed in that private space that I would never able to be able to access. And Warren and Rasmussen talk about these gender dimensions and physical attractiveness. And one of my colleagues was like, why don't you use it to your advantage? Wear a skirt. Look cute when you go. Don't look like a professor. Look like you're accessible. And I kind of was like, really? I should use my sexuality or my cuteness or whatever to get access? And he was like, yeah, okay. Ethical issues, maybe. So I had to actually think about these things and then figure out how was I going to then walk the line to make sure that I wasn't misleading or leading people on. Sherrod, talking about coffee. So Sherrod sat down with me for a regular interview. We talked for over an hour and the following week when I go to the nonprofit organization, he would sort of be hanging around waiting for me. Finally, he caught up the nerve like on the third or fourth time, can I have your number, you know, take you out for coffee, help you with your research. And I was like, no thanks, I'm good. And from that instance, I started wearing a wedding ring. I'm not married, but I started wearing a ring on my middle, on my ring finger to sort of have an ambiguous status. I started becoming asking to be called professor instead of Keisha. Um, and this was, as Gurney stated, was supposed to be if you're perceived as attached, it would reduce the type of hustling. So I took on a persona of being friendly but detached. I was not going to be anybody's buddy. I wasn't going to give anybody money if they asked for money. Um, I went into the study with no budget, like zero budget. Um, so I wasn't paying anybody for their time to sit down and interview with me. So I really had to be friendly and accessible but not start accepting invitations to go out for coffee. And I'll get to reason why um, that's important. Kino sat down with me. He, at the time, I did not know this, but he was uh, convicted of distribution and possession and had 21 aliases. Right off the bat, did not trust me. I ain't signing what you asking for, why you asking? We literally went through this rapport. I would ask a question, he would not sign consent. He would then say, that's a stupid question. And I would try to explain why I was asking a question about his religiosity or about his, his um, his racial, how did he identify racially? He's like, I'm black, can't you tell? And I'm like, well, this is New York, this is New York area, you could be Dominican and Latin. Yeah, but I'm black. Okay, thank you very much. It was sort of this antagonistic conversation, but we were talking. And that's one thing you have to realize when you're in the field, they may not follow. My participants did what they wanted to do. You had to recognize their agency to be independent and respond to you as how they felt it versus responding to how I wanted them to follow the questions. I had to collect data in a structured fashion, IRB approval, put that to the side, and just had a conversation with him. At the very end of this conversation, he was like, I was only going to sign that form once I knew what you were going to ask. That whole idea of trust, but giving participants agency to figure out what they wanted to do. If they wanted to sign, if not, I had several people not sign the informed consent, but I have great field notes because I sat down and actually just had a conversation with them. So here are some lessons learned um, from my time in the field. 
So do your preliminary research. I think ethnography has this great value of giving you your individual insight about what you are interested in. Go network, go talk to people. I, um, I networked in, in New, New York and Newark and ran actually a book club at Fortune Society as preliminary research a whole year before I went into the field just to sort of get a sense of what does the returning population look like? How do they talk? What kind of language? What kind of questions should I ask or should I not ask? In terms of gender, if you're going into male-dominated um, areas and you're a woman, you should, be con you should be concerned about not your safety, but concerned about how does gender play out in collecting data? Um, how does it play out with men asking you for coffee? And what do you do? And you should think about, well, what happens if that happens? Someone wants to help you out for your research and become sort of this hustle line. You have to remember it's a two-way street. Just as you are observing them, they're observing you. And they're watching how you behave, what you do, if you say no or if you say yes to certain things. So taking on this friendly and detached persona, I said no to anybody that would ask me for cash. I had lots of people in various ways ask me for money. Um, like some professors get paid, I'm not sure who they are, but I did not have cash. But I bought GED prep material. I brought notebooks, I bought paper, I bought those GED computerized calculator like $35 when I was like, here's one from you know Walmart for $2.99 and they were like, you can't do GED on that. Oh, so I learned, but I bought, I, I paid for things in a different way versus giving them cash. I try to be helpful in their in educational. Cultural context, a uh, former student of mine who had a felony conviction that I did not know, um, he came up to me and he's like, I heard you're doing the study. And I was like, yes. And you're looking for research assistance? Yes. <laughs> well, why don't I just be your consultant? OK. No, really, I did five years. Oh, let's sit down and talk. I found this individual just because I was publicizing what I wanted to do. Um, and he came to me on his own just because he thought it was important to understand the impact of felony conviction, what happens with reentry, and what do drug convictions in particular do to individuals. Flexibility, I um, made a lot of stuff up on the fly to ensure that individual participants had their own agency. If they didn't want to talk to me, I let them go, but I didn't force them to sit down. Um, but I found out over 29 months that a lot of people would see me so if I try to figure out what's that chick doing, what's, what is she about, what is she, you know, is she going to report anybody? And then a few months later they would come back and be like, so I'm ready to sit down and talk to you. Um, and try to have that flexibility totally help. So benefits of ethnography, you get first-hand accounts, um, which I think are really, really important. You figure out how to communicate their language, their experiences, to then impact of how the public policy shaped that experience. So I did not tell them I'm a political scientist and I care about public policies and the impact. I kept the language of the academy out of my conversations and just wanted to know what their experiences were versus me trying to figure out what journal am I going to publish this in, what press do, am I, my book project going to go to, um, that it really helps individuals then talk about their experiences, yields insight and new findings, and provides a comprehensive sense of what's going on. Professor Roberts at the very beginning um, said in his opening remarks about justice and justice for all. So it's important to talk to everybody, sort of the 360 degree uh, review of what punishment looks like, what re-entry looks like, what a felony conviction looks like, from not just the policymakers, but those that are actually experiencing it. Thank you. because all of my panelists stayed under time or within time. I'm so excited about the conversation that we can now have with you. I appreciate all of these comments and giving us a lot to think about in terms of one's individual identity, if we're talking about the researcher, him or herself, or the groups that we're studying, participants in our work, thinking of one's connection to the locus of state control, understanding the history, of how people become attached uh, to these mechanisms of, of state control, but also the kind of institutions and their transformation over time to sort of 
speak back to policy, speak back to the context of what's happening. So if you have questions, we're looking forward to answering them. Line up. Hello. Um, so um, with uh, kind of like in the same dynamic of um, trying to get to the bottom rather than from the top down approach of policy, um, what I'm really curious about is how to shape, understand, or improve the understanding that general society has of um, incarcerated or previously incarcerated peoples. I feel that you know a lot of time, especially with you know uh, legislators, policymakers, that's their responsibility. It's their constituents, and so I feel like the public's opinion and understanding. Um, is something that a lot of times might get missed, especially when um, sociological uh, information just dehumanizes with all the statistics, you know, and maybe ethnography only reaches the academics, you know. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, know what you guys feel about that. Well, I, I, so ethnography is really just stories, and the public has many stories. There are multiple stories. Um, many people um, have organized non-academic forums in which those kinds of experiences are relatable without you know, of course, I'm going to always resort to the arcane academic language that I'm familiar with, but the fact is that there's a lot of ways to connect with people, and that's what these stories are about. And so I think that organizations and um, individuals who decide to make themselves uh, available and, in a sense, vulnerable to scrutiny um, by sharing their stories, I think that that is a really powerful and important kind of mechanism uh, that bypasses, in some sense, some of the dilemmas that ethnographers find themselves uh, within. Uh, I think ethnographers our, themselves or ourselves, since I did start trying to do a little bit of ethnographic work, um, also uh, have that kind of responsibility as well. I do feel like we need to move beyond the choir. We were just talking about this, the panelists and I, before this, um, how you know, it's a wonderful audience. It's really, it's it's really um, a, a wide array of, of people and positions and occupations and different ways of becoming involved in challenging punishment. But I do think I think the stories are important ways, and the other kinds of representations, uh, visual representations, for all their problems, uh, do have a way of reaching people. And so I, I think that those are are important. I'd like to I'd like to add to that. Um, Journalists often facilitate and nurture relationships with academics, and we as ethnographers have a responsibility to make sure the good stories get put out versus all the negativity and, and the bad labeling. Um, a lot of us have positive stories to tell about individuals that are actually great individuals except for that one portion of their lives that are criminal. Um, but otherwise, they are mothers and fathers and siblings and all the rest, and we have a responsibility then to make sure we're communicating to a wider audience versus just the choir or to other individuals that have our same um, philosophy or ideological perspective. Um, my name's Andrea Barrow. I'm an Iris graduate, um, and Keisha was actually my professor when I was here in 2007. And Keisha also wrote um, a recommendation for me for law school, and so I am forever indebted. Um, uh, I love the panel. Um, when I left law school, I worked for a year as a public defender. Um, and now I run the New York City Criminal Justice Agency supervised release program out of Manhattan Criminal Court. And with those experiences, I can tell you that at a very local level, 
um, all of the punishment that we're talking about here today is run on narrative. Um, when I was a public defender, the narrative that I had to piece together at arraignment um, before seeing a judge was the story that determined whether or not this person would be released or they would stay in, oftentimes. Um, sometimes the severity of the charge, but even then, depending on who that person was, if it was put into context, then maybe they could, their fate would change. Um, and so my question is really, essentially what the other person just asked, um, uh, you know, now as I run this supervised release program, which really is just an opportunity to allow people charged with nonviolent felony offenses to be out in the community as opposed to be put um, behind bars, um, one of the things that we grapple with is how do prosecutors, judges, defense lawyers, and even our participants, the defendants themselves, um, put f a story together that will allow these decision makers to give them opportunities that will allow them to change the course of their lives to the extent that it's possible with the resources that we have. And so I really, really appreciated um, hearing that journalists often work closely. And I encourage everybody here who's doing this sort of work to think about ways of getting it out at a very local, lower level, even into the ear of more, pro more conservative um, folks, because you know people in this city, this two, these two cities, um, have an idea about who is deserving of opportunity and who is not. Um, and if you go to any arraignment part in any borough at any moment, you see that playing out, and we need stories to be better and fuller. Um, so that's really all I want to say, thanks. And there are no psychologists on this panel, but I think you know it really is hard to get people to change their negative constructions about something versus reaffirming what they already know, especially if it is negative. But I'm really curious about perhaps Rick's answer to this question of, of the narratives that are told about individuals and their connections to the system all along the carceral continuum and how is there a possibility for this to shift or change where there might be a more positive uh, perception of these individuals? Well, I mean, I guess I would say that my experience with that has been that people looking at me when I interview them think that I'm expecting a certain narrative, uh, dominant narrative, and so they don't disappoint when they give it to me. You know, it's very hard to get past that. There is a narrative beyond that. It's very, very difficult for people to provide you with that narrative that's their inner narrative. You really can't, and it takes a long time to get to it. And people sometimes don't even realize that they, that they have that alternative narrative because they've been so inured, so accustomed to give them the narrative that's a dominant one, you know? And so whenever, you, whenever I do that, I, I, all I tend to get are those dominant narratives. I'm, I'm a criminal, I'm a bad person, I'm a drug addict. I'm to blame for this. I'm, you can't get, you really have a very difficult time getting beyond that. You know? And I, I've given up actually trying to do so. I, it can be done, but it's a fool's errand, I think. Um, so yeah, I would say that there are other, other ways that you can make that point. But I would say that it's a incumbent upon us to begin to establish alternative narratives. Um, we are the ones that should be the leadership role of this. I don't think that we should be looking necessarily to our uh, participants as the ones that are going to show us the way out of this morass. It's us. It's us that have to do it. And we need to let them know that it's okay to have those narratives and that we have them and we share them. Um, you know, I, I, I feel guilty about uh, going to conferences and participating with law enforcement officials and parroting the, the narratives that, that are um, being used to set up the systems that are so insidious and so pervasive now, you know? I really have a difficult time combating that um, because it's so pervasive and it's so many people's checks, it's so many people's paychecks, you know? But I've, I've, I've begun to withdraw from that, to tell you the truth. I don't want to contribute to it. Um, I think there are other ways to do so. Um, partnering with those that we <coughs> study is perhaps one of the most effective ways to do so. 
Um, that's why I'm a member of four harm reduction programs. That's why I like to spend my time there rather than going to conferences, frankly, you know. Um, well, Camila, since you're, you know, at the beginning of, of your career, how might you think of perhaps an intervention um, with the narratives that you're getting and this idea of heroin fade as if people have no agency, but you are the purveyor in some way of exposing these worlds, so. Yeah, the conversation about agency, it always shows up. Um, I think that one of the major, the, the biggest barriers that we have as, as, as ethnographers is not just doing good ethnography and being able to portray it, it's being able to network with other, other, um, how should I put this, um, areas, arenas that could comprehensively, along with us, help us change drug policy uh, and, and not preach to the choir and not just be a paycheck, a conference paycheck, or um, the sort of things that Rick was talking about. It is depressing. If it, it is a depressing endeavor if that is what we're doing. And, hope in the, and I think that as we speak here in this ivory tower, the people that we are talking about are right now getting arrested, are right now suffering from very low self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because of the punishment approach. And that is so because we are yet to be successful at networking to change drug policy. It's been over 100 years of this problem. Um, uh, good afternoon. My name is Maurice. And like Rick, I grew up in Brownsville. I don't, live, I don't currently live there. but. However, I did return to the community to set up a program with the 73rd Precinct and we work with PSA too. My question is directly to Rick. Um, being that you're um, currently residing in Brownsville um, and you experiencing from a Caucasian standpoint what some of these young Afri African American and Latinos are experiencing, are you willing or I'm not gonna assume that you're not, but are you willing to be involved with what happens with these people that's right there because we speak constantly out there. We do a lot of work out there with, but we don't really have no Caucasians in our, in our groups that is experiencing what you're experiencing with your credentials and with your history. We can definitely use you if you're willing and that's, is my, that's, that's what I'm asking you this afternoon. How could I say no to something like that? I, I'll, I'll talk to you in the break. <laughs> I mean, I actually thought, you know, with Occupy Wall Street, there was a bit of a universalization that might have created an opening. I'm like, oh, college students are getting, you know, uh, pepper sprayed by the police. This is going to mean something, you know, akin to Freedom Summer and what that meant uh, to an opening for the civil rights movement. But I think, you know, because of the labeling of the groups that we're talking about and the kind of you know, cost of doing all this. Look at Rick, how credentialed and accomplished he is, and there's still great cost that he bears. So it's a lot to ask, but I'm so happy that you two have connected on that. Thank you very much for the information that you've provided us. It's highly informative. My question uh, is to the panel, but particularly Carmilla. I appreciate the dynamics and all of the uh, emotion that you presented with uh, collecting data from the uh, Herian population. But I'm just curious, I mean, you told us openly that you paid for your data. Uh, number one, was that the only way that you felt like you could get a response? And number two, did you feel like you had to give something back uh, in order to get the information that you had? Uh, you know, $20 maybe to you and I won't go very far, but for someone who doesn't have it, it could um, mean a meal or more heroin. And just posing this question to Keisha, who said up front, I'm not going to give you any money. I, I'm going to do the best I can with what I have, and that may include putting a ring on and, uh, you know, getting information that way. You're the two approaches to gathering data, assessing it, analyzing it, and then reporting out is absolutely fascinating, but it's a dichotomy. Can you two please speak to how you got your information? Thank you. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Um, and the answer is simple. Um, I was at the time a doctoral student at the New School for Social Research, and uh, they didn't give me the money. I requested. So, um, I asked for money from the school for dissertation work and research, and um, I, I didn't get it. So I had to find alternative ways to pay for it because it is the study that I wanted to do within the time frame that I wanted to do it, and so that's why. Um, the other question was regarding uh, in monetary incentives, right? For, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did I feel that, that uh, yeah, you, you asked, did I feel that I got something for the money that I paid? That was your question, right? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I got uh, uh, basically 28 individuals' humanity totally dropped on me. Unless you pay for it. Oh, okay. Um, I would have gotten that information uh, regardless. Uh, the reason why is because I am very familiar with the, with the injection drug using population here in New York City and in Puerto Rico. I'm very familiar with syringe exchange. That's what I do for a living, one of the things that I do for a living. So they feel very comfortable with me and they are very easy and eager to talk to me. I don't need to pay, but I was comfortable paying nonetheless. Um, yep. Can I just respond before you do? I, I always pay. I get paid for what I do. Why should the people that I work with not get paid for what they do in providing me information? I, I totally agree about paying participants. In an earlier study I did, I had the funding. Um, I applied for additional funding and re-entry became unpopular in terms of getting funded support. So then I had to make a calculation of how much of my own personal funds I could invest without not paying rent and so forth. So I did lots of other things in exchange instead of actually giving money. So I taught GED classes. I bought food and lunch. I bought coffee. I um, paid for GED prep material. So I might not have been giving cash to all the participants, but I tried to give them something in exchange for them allowing me to ask them questions. Um, I wish I had money to do it, but once you give someone $20, everybody expects $20, and I then would have to have a budgetary restraint on how many people I actually interacted with. So I made a choice of like, I can spend $50 and pay for lunch for everybody, but I can't give everybody um, money for the 29 months I was in the field. Thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, for a wonderful panel. My name is Dwayne Nash, and um, I'm actually a PhD student, but I was a former prosecutor here in Manhattan. Um, part of what I did was a lot of drug um, cases, the felony drug cases. Um, what I'm interested in is uh, your views on the role of gender in your ethnographies. Uh, I noticed that uh, Camilla, you had mentioned that there were only four uh, female interlocutors. Uh, and I think it's incredibly important to recognize the effect of uh, narcotics abuse in, on women, in particular how society views women that are uh, drug abusers, how the court systems uh, view these women. Uh, part of my research is historical. Well, my research is historical, and I look at um, court cases and narratives in court cases from the 60s and 70s during the early drug wars. Um, and what I'm seeing is that women are treated um, far more harshly. Uh, to your point, Nancy, um, gender is important. And today, we find that there is uh, an increase in white women in prison. Um, and that's not actually being talked about. I suspect a lot of these white women that are now in prison causing the white women, female population to increase is because a lot of them might, in fact, be on drugs. So um, I, basically, what, what is this role that gender is playing and, um, and the attention that ethnographers are giving to gender? And for the last point, to include you, Rick, um, I think your work is great. Uh, also, it was uh, a racial profiling case um, that I experienced in the DA's office here where uh, one white person was with two black people and the police arrested and charged the two black people but let the white person go. Um, that's what made me leave the, office, the district attorney's office and go on to do this type of research for myself. So um, my applaud to you for recognizing um, the privilege of whiteness 
um, and also how geography, white, whites in a certain geography, also make you susceptible to stop and frisk. Thank you. I think I should take that question. Um, so uh, thank you for it. Um, historically, often when women drug users come to um, attention, they're, it, they're used to justify uh, more punitive policies. And when they are, the, the cases themselves, historically, uh, we have seen um, the justification of, of punishments um, that are now, you know, thanks to National Advocates for Pregnant Women, et cetera, really, you know, um, we see patterns where once we saw just one case after another, little cases, of um, punishments being justified uh, in, in ways that are uh, con controlling uh, reproductive rights and certainly controlling women's access to their children. And so I think there's much more recognition um, than there has been in the past. But um, there has been a pattern of racial privilege. Uh, in, in other words, white women's drug use has been medicalized and the drug use of women of color has been criminalized. And you begin to see that sort of widening um, in the 1950s. But in the 1950s, um, there were many recognitions that there were more women out there in need of treatment than there was actually treatment for them. Uh, there was, uh, in other words, amongst people who actually dealt with women, uh, there was an understanding that there was a much uh, greater number of women than were actually coming to notice. When they did come to notice, they came to notice often in very, in, in ways that uh, led them to uh, be, be punished. But when they didn't come to notice, they were medicalized. It was a kind of uh, dynamic that undeniably, um, a form of institutionalized racism in the basic sort of ways in which women have been responded to historically. Uh, today, I'll let you answer those questions. Well, you know, the rise of, um, that you speak about in uh, the, the female population, the white female population in, in jail, I'm, not, I'm no expert on that. But um, lately, trends are that prescription drug use is pr very prevalent amongst white women and because of it's harder to acquire, right? Be with the DEA uh, coming down harshly on uh, medical doctors and ph pharmacists, et cetera, uh, they're going, they're shifting to heroin. So, and we have so many white women who are, so we may be witnessing a third wave. We know, uh, there's, prescription drug use tends to be hidden, right, in your house. You don't need to be copying prescription drugs in the, in the, in the corner, on uh, one, one, two, and fifth in legs. Um, you usually do it in the privacy of a doctor, doctor's office. And that's how women have to do it, precisely because they just have more to lose than men, men do, like kids, right? Yeah, and that's why you're, you found very few interlocutors that were female for your, sub, for your study. Thank you, Thank you for your question. Hi, uh, my name's Matt, I'm from Philadelphia. This is an amazing uh, conference. I came to, to, to participate as much as I can. Uh, I'm also curious about sort of connecting what you all do and um, sort of people who work within the system um, to the grassroots organizing on the ground and the movement building that is happening, happening I think slower than we'd like to see it, but is, is starting to happen. And it seems to me um, that um, ethnographers and sociologists um, need to get better about sort of translating or communicating their findings in a way that's easily accessible to the general public and that the organizers on the ground need to get better about really studying the stuff that you all put out and getting smarter and being able to you know describe it ourselves and I'm sort of very interested in that in-between space I'm a lawyer but I came to law school as an activist and I stopped practicing law and I'm, I'm also a filmmaker and I made a movie about mass incarceration called Broken on All Sides, um, also about systemic racism, so I'm using that as an organizing tool. And I think there have been a lot of good, actually, movies and sort of creative ways to 
communicate to people sort of the political framework and the statistics in a way that people can understand. I know Fury is here from Students Against Mass Incarceration. He's interested in developing an album of work, hip hop work, about mass incarceration by people who are directly impacted. And so I guess the other thing is if a movement is going to build, I think we need to tap into the creativity and voices of people who are most impacted. So how, I guess my question is, how can we tap into that creativity and how can we start to navigate that space in between the grassroots organizing and the sort of academic work? Thank you. Yeah, um, I have a, the perfect example. I think um, in anthropology, there's, if there's one person who can, uh, who, who is a pillar example of what you just asked about, is Nancy Shepard Hughes. And her advocacy, her militant advocacy, uh, where her work, her anthropological work, because it was political, because it was urgent, because there was an emergency that she was attending, she made it personal and openly personal, blasted as a subjective anthropologist, as losing her objectivity, therefore, and therefore being less academic than she should be. Uh, didn't care and went all the way. And I think we all need to be a little bit more like, like that. Hi, uh, my name is Allison Martin. A few people have mentioned um, the difficulty with contacting journalists, and I just kind of wanted to raise my hand. Um, I'm an investigative journalist and a documentary photographer. I'm here with my co-author, and there are a lot of us who are pretty desperate to connect with people like you. So I'm Allison. Let's <laughs> connect. <laughs> Thank you. OK, these will have to be brief questions, and these are the last ones. Hello, um, my name is Victoria Chantrell Asperian. I have um, a personal connection with the criminal justice system because I'm the first out of my older siblings to not have a felony or a pending conviction. In fact, two weeks before I was going to grad or did graduate from Stanford with two degrees, my brother, who I'm the closest to, was released from a federal penitentiary. And what I want to ask, and it's not necessarily because of drug use, but it's because of drug dealing. And many of you have talked about sympathy, empathy, making drug users be more human. Is there a place for ethnographic researchers to also humanize drug dealers, mules, and other people who are still very much a part of the criminal justice system and a racist superstructure that we live in that limits opportunities, that pushes people out to the fringe? Thank you. Great question. In terms of the distribution charges, the individuals that I spoke to, um, they admitted they never used. For them, it was an economic vehicle. Um, but the way we criminalize drug convictions, besides if it's use, possession, or distribution, um, they're affected the same way. So the whole idea is if we decouple the economics of dealing from the choice of using or, the, or why people use, um, that might help, but that's a long road to start fine-tuning policies that generalize across a whole bunch of different people related to drugs. I will say, I, I think there's been amazing ethnographic work on drug dealers, because if you think about the way in which traffickers and dealers have been almost, they're, they're labeled as deservedly dehumanized, right? They're made, oh, entirely responsible for the, the whole context. And so I think that, um, hmm. okay, sorry. Uh, so, so I think you know, some of the work uh, that's been done on women uh, drug dealers, Eloise Dunlap's work, and uh, y you know, there, there really is um, something there that we should be paying attention to and, and amplifying um, a little bit more. And thanks for drawing our attention to it. Hi, um, this isn't a question, it's just more of a very brief comment. Um, I'm an anthropologist and I'm an ethnographer, and um, I just wanted to point out for anybody else who's an anthropologist in here is that a lot of times we tend to think that we have a monopoly on this method of ethnography. And if you look at the panel, there's one anthropologist out of four. And so one of the things that I think this conversation 
really can speak to is the fact that this method should be used by people in other disciplines and not by, like what Keisha said, Keisha, right? That it's not by accident, but this actually should be an intentional method that should be used to draw attention to very, really important things in addition to, of course, different kinds of methods, but it shouldn't be relegated as something that isn't important and should be something that we should celebrate in all sorts of, especially in academia, but in academic disciplines. So I encourage everybody to really sort of embrace that and to just look at the diversity of disciplines as Thank sort you. of a way to do that. Thank you. Hi, also sort of a comment, but also it could be turned into a question. And just in, Rick, you were saying that it's a fool's errand to um, discuss the ethnography of a drug user or something positive or a drug dealer perhaps, but I think that we have a major mainstream form of ethnography that's really been mainstream popularized in the past 30 years and that's hip hop music. It's, you have, it's such a popular form of music and you have like a largely uh, suburban white America listening to this music and it's about street life and the war on drugs and how it has affected these communities. So I feel like, at that being said, also there's this kind of perverse contradiction where it's like we're listening to this music, but yet the policies that are affecting these communities which are discussing these issues are so racist and negative. And so I just wanted to say that, that I think you know the ethnography is out there. And like Matt said, uh, yeah, I happen to be working on a hip hop album about this. But I, you know, um, kind of stumbling at the end of it, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, panel, I appreciate your comments. Um, I don't want to hold people up from lunch, but thank you, Keisha. Thank you, Camila, Nancy, Rick. I'm Carla Shedd. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs>